You're all very welcome to Live Irish Myths in Conversation. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. This is episode seven of our, our now weekly talks. I am delighted and honoured this evening to have as my guest, uh, Mairead, sorry, you may uh, just uh, help us with the pronunciation of your surname. Uh, Carew. Mairead Carew, I do apologise. I've been saying Carew. Carew, Mairead, you're very welcome. Mairead is the author of two books, actually. The one we're going to be sort of focusing most of our attention on tonight is Tara and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but Mairead is also the author of The Quest for the Irish Celt. Uh, uh, Mairead, you're very welcome to this evening's conversation. Uh, and I hope and I know that I'll enjoy it and I hope that you enjoy it as well. S sort of to kick off what I generally ask guests to do is to just give us a little bit of background about themselves and also to tell us how you kind of stumbled into the whole arena of the British Israelites and Tara. Mm -hmm. well, well, I studied archaeology out in uh, UCD and I um, was working uh, for Connor Newman on the survey of Tara. It was meant to be just a, a, a three month uh, research project on um, uh, aerial photography because he was doing the geophysical survey yeah. so a uh, part of my job was to go into the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland and have a look at their files and while I was there I came across a file on the British Israelites so then later on I was asked just to come back and maybe write up an article on it but when I started to research it it became obvious that there was a lot of material on it particularly in the National Library so I was invited back to uh, write the book so it, it wasn't so much that I was interested in British Israelites I was interested in the Hill of Tara but then obviously became interested in why they dug up the wrath of the synods and basically destroyed it uh, looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah uh, it, 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 the discovery program was a brilliant a program of research wasn't it and, and mm -hmm. quite sort of wide-ranging in its scope wasn't it oh yeah like while connor um was doing the geophysical survey i mean that was very new at the time in the 1990s um and edel vrenock was doing a um a big uh, uh project on the whole uh, historical sources and then i was doing the tar and the ark project and they had many other projects as well uh on the go um, there, there's a big project on stone forts in Galway as well. Had anything much been published in relation to the uh, Ark of the Covenant and the British Israelites at that point? Oh no, very little. It, it was mentioned just briefly, say, in the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries. And it was kind of surprising that the archaeologists kind of ignored it. Um, it was main, it mainly uh, was written about in the newspapers of, of the time because there's a big uh, campaign um, against the explorations. But the archaeologists themselves didn't write about it. Mm. Yeah, of course, the situation back then, we'll get a chance to cover that, of course, was quite different politically and from a religious standpoint. The British Israelites, I mean, for people who don't know who they are, what kind of group they are or were, um, give us a, a sort of a brief introduction to them and tell us what makes them different to what you might call a sect or a cult. Right. Well, um, the British Israel Association was founded by Edward Wheeler Bird, and he was a retired Anglo uh, in English, sorry, an Anglo Indian judge, and it was founded in 1889. And the core belief uh, was that the British people were descended from the lost tribes of Israel. And it's different from a cult in that it didn't matter what uh, denomination you were, as long as you, you were a Protestant. But uh, they explored their ideas in the Covenant people and in the Banner of Israel. They were their journals. And in, in there, they discussed ideas about whether uh, Catholics would be allowed to be British Israelites um, because they were just led astray by 
um, priests or whether Jews were allowed to be British Israelites. Um, so they were quite uh, open to a variety of ideas, uh, provided um, that you believed in the theory about being descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Um, and uh, the British Israel Association of Ireland then was set up in uh, 1897. And it's possible uh, that they were set up with the intention of recovering the Ark of the Covenant uh, from the Hill of Tara. And they were affiliated to um, Edward Wheeler Bird's Association uh, in, in London. Um, and as far as being a cult was concerned, they, they definitely didn't consider themselves to be a cult. And in the Covenant people, they, they wrote that they were, they were no sect or no new religion or no antichrist. And um, Did they have the tacit approval of the Church of England at the time? Was it yeah, well, I, I mean, the, there was no, there wasn't a conflict of interest for example, and they were described as sort of an interdenominational fellowship. Um, so um, they weren't in general considered to be a cult at all. Um, but um, they got their actual ideas really from associating early Irish history and mythology with uh, biblical stories so that uh, when Solomon, the son of David and king of Israel, when he died in 933 BC, um, his kingdom was divided and 10 of the 12 tribes constituted the people of the northern kingdom. And then following the conquest by Assyrians in 721 BC, they, they, they were dispersed and they disappeared from history. And British Israelites then thought that they had gone to Northern Europe and that they had reassembled to form the British people. So, um, uh, you, and you have a lot of books that are written in the 19th century, like exploring these kind of ideas. Um, one, for example, there's a fellow called John Wilson of Brighton. Um, he was an Irish weaver and he wrote about the idea in uh, lectures on our Israelite uh, origin, which was published in 1840. And he was studying the origins of the English language and coming to the conclusion that really it was pure Hebrew. Um, so therefore the British Israelites were the descendants of the wandering biblical Hebrews and heirs to the covenant of Jacob. So it's all that type of stuff. Yes, and I, we'll get to the linguists because I know that uh, we'll be mentioning the, the name Charles Valency uh, not in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you how they promulgated their message, but it seems that the main uh, the main uh, vehicles for that were, were the, the, the covenant people and the banner of Israel. Did mm -hmm. they have a popular following or was this just like a, a band of were they all male too like was it a band of brothers yeah well it generally attracted people from the upper classes and the gentry you, you know and the clergy and intellectuals and antiquarians people like that um but uh when it's written about it's, it's often referred to as a kind of a surrogate nationalism and uh because um they were very patriotic and public opinion at the time would have been very much in favour of Queen Victoria and expansion of empire ideas. Um, and I, I suppose in terms of uh, women being involved, like, like a lot of um, cultural institutions at the time, women didn't have a major role and they certainly weren't allowed to be members of the Council of the British Israel Association um, or anything like that. Um, um, they have been associated with uh, white supremacism because they believed themselves to be the chosen people. They believed that the white race was inherently superior. Uh, they were a race apart and that they should lead 
the world by divine appointment so that they were uh, guided by God to expand the empire. Um, so, uh, so they would have uh, seen themselves as being very patriotic and to have a differential attitude towards authority and that kind of thing. In terms of their attitude towards the Irish, and of course, I'm not necessarily talking about the landed Irish, I'm talking about the indigenous Irish. They classed, they classed the indigenous Irish as Canaanites, didn't they? In other words, as enemies of Israel. So that justified their conquest of Ireland. Yeah, well, they had some very strange ideas uh, um, around that. Um, initially, um, when they studied, say, Lar Gwala, Aaron, or Book of Invasions, um, where there was ideas about um, the Irish being descended from Meal of Spain and from the Phoenicians, who are a Semitic people descended from the Canaanites. So um, the idea then was that the disloyal Irish were half Canaanite and that the Ulster Protestants were identified with as the real Irish and the descendants of the tribe of Dan. So then the idea was that Ireland had been inhabited by Israelites who were driven out by the half Canaanite Gales. So then when Britain colonized Ireland, it was like they were just taking back what was theirs in the first place. <laughs> you know, that's that's convenient, isn't it? <laughs> their whole system yeah. of belief. Yeah. Um, so it, it, the, 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 the tribe of Dan comes up, uh, and it comes mm. up, as you, you know, online quite a lot in, in discussion. The tribe of Dan, is it the British Israelite movement that considers the tribe of Dan to be, because of certain biblical passages, the tribe of Dan will, will not be among the tribes to be, to be given access to the New Jerusalem and that somehow they're involved in, in the, the despicable events of the end of the world. Is that something you're familiar with? Well, in the 19th century, they seem to discuss the tribe of Dan as being the ones who were Israel and were entitled to rule Ireland. Um, you know, the, the, the attitude to the tribe of Dan wasn't negative. Yeah. You know, um, so they, they regarded Tara then to be the spiritual birthplace of the Anglo-Saxon nation and Tara to be the new Jerusalem in the new resuscitated Israel. It was all that kind of, kind of thing. I mean, we, 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 can, we look at it all now and we consider it almost comical, but, but they yeah. sort of steadfastly believed this stuff, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, they, they, they did, because uh, um, like a, a lot of it was to do with, say, like you mentioned, Charles uh, Valancy, um, because he, whereas Wilson was studying English, Charles Valancy was studying Old Irish and uh, comparing it to uh, ancient Hebrew. Uh, and uh, I mean, he... He was born in 1726 um, and he was a professional surveyor and a cartographer and he actually did good work as he a did. surveyor, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. um, uh, you know, on, on New Grange and he did the first one inch scale map of Ireland and he was one of the founder members of the Royal Irish Academy. So he did a lot of good work, but when he, he um, published his uh, paper on the essay on the antiquity of the Irish language in 1772. Um, even at that stage in like scholarly circles, he was considered not to be doing good work. Even in his own lifetime, he was discredited. And yet the British Israelites used his work um, to pinpoint Tara and um, you know, because they believed that England, English was destined to become the language of the universe. So it's all, again, about expansion of empire ideas Ooh. and that this would be a reversal to the time of when you only need one language and it was pure Hebrew. Of course, it's a reverse, isn't it, of the story of the Tower of Babel, where the language yeah. was originally said to have been confused and separated. So that yeah, yeah, exactly. 
And so we're yeah. getting back towards a time when we would speak one language. And of course, the British Israelites believed yeah. that English being uh, an offshoot of Hebrew was going to be yeah. the language of the new millennium, if that's the... the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, so so, so like it, it was like that they had this divine right. And so if you could spread English all over the world, then really you'd be doing God's will and uh, you'd be going back to the state of pure Hebrew all over the world. We should say a word or two about Valency. Um, I've written about Charles Valency. He made, yeah. as you mentioned there, in fairness to him, he made yeah. quite an interesting, he, he, he did, he made good contributions to certain areas. He gave us, I think, the first proper plan of Newgrange. I mm -hmm. think he was the first of the antiquarians to suggest an astronomical function of Newgrange. Mm -hmm. He, as you rightly point out, he, he, he surveyed Ireland and produced a, 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 what, what is now considered to, looking back, to have been one of, one of the most detailed and excellently produced maps of the time but was it was it Edward Ledwich who said that no one had written more nonsense in his time than, <laughs> than Valency or was it someone else I know Ledwich I think said, it might have been Ledwich uh, uh, I mean uh, he used the word yeah. soporific which I, I mean, yeah. which I think means inducing one to sleep to you know? sleep yeah and somebody else said his work was full of hair-brained fancy you know so um he you know, he, he wasn't uh, good at the linguistics, even in his own lifetime. So part, part of the problem with the British Israelites is that they were just using all these different uh, sources without really examining them properly or in any sort of detail. Um, well, Valency had an air of respectability. As you say, he was yeah. a founder member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, he yeah. had this... Uh, uh, Collectania de Rebus Cybernicus, that was his, uh, would you call that a journal? Uh, journal, yeah. He, he, yeah. I mean, he certainly had an air of, you know, uh, superior knowledge about him, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. But so, I, I mean, John O'Donovan really disapproved of him and thought his work was not good at all, you know. Um, but I mean, at the time when they were discussed it, discussing uh, philology or linguistics, um, there was the idea that you could kind of casually get a collection of words and compare them with similar words when they mightn't have had any connection at all in, in, in real terms. Uh, because there was another man called Reverend Frederick Glover. I, I don't know if you heard of him. Yeah. He wrote uh, England, the remnant of Judah, and the Israel of Ephraim. And he actually has a chapter in that book. Um, and British Israelites were quite interested in this. And it was called the Hebraical, the Etymological Coincidences of Tara. And that was the point, really. Um, it, it meant that they were comparing, uh, say, suggesting that uh, the word Tara came from Torah or olive, as in olive fall, it meant prophecy. Um, and that Leah Fall was half Celtic and half Hebrew, um, and, and that they weren't just coincidences. They suggested the introduction of a Hebrew system, uh, you know, all that type of stuff. Is it fair to say that to the uninitiated, you know, uh, being sort of bamboozled with all this stuff, that you, you may initially sort of say, hmm, there's an air of credibility about all of this? Yeah, well... Maybe at the time, except that it, it, it's, it's too loosely put together. Do you know what I mean? So, so they have their biblical story and then they have an Irish story. And like, it's not really clear, for example, why they would say um, all of Fola was the prophet Jeremiah. Like there's no, there's no real connection. I always said about that, Maraid, I always said, if that was the case, remembering that most of the Irish mythology was written down by Christian monks in monasteries, yeah. if they knew that all of Fala was Jeremiah, surely they would have been singing from the rooftops about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah it, it's just, it, it just seems to come out of nowhere. Like, you know, if you're trying to research it or trace it back, it just, yeah, I don't know where the origin of it is, or that Tia Tefe was the daughter of Zedekiah, or 
you know yeah, those type of things i was going to say that was the next question was was tell us a little bit if you can about how they came to believe that the british royal family were descended from the from the biblical line of david through the kings and queens of tara well well again it's it's uh, through their study of early irish history and mythology and putting it in a biblical framework and um there was the the story of uh, Tia Teffy was that she, according to Irish tradition anyway, was that she uh, came from Thebes in Egypt and she was a daughter of a pharaoh and she married King Aramon, a son of Mil of Spain. And she became homesick, so Aramon built her the fort uh, on Tara. And the this, the story, that story of Tia Tefe came from a, a poem written by Cohen O'Lochon um, in the 11th uh, century. And they associated her with, as being daughter of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, and the last king in the line of David, um, who reigned there from 597 to 586 uh, BC. But it, it's not really clear why they make that uh, association, but they believed her to be a princess of the line of uh, David and uh, the first of a new order uh, of monarchs. And that then the, they, and they thought that Tia Tefe was then buried on the hill of Tara with the Ark of the Covenant. And if they recovered the Ark of the Covenant, it would prove the theories about the British Israelites. And they wanted to present the Ark of the Covenant to Queen Victoria. And when she died, then they wanted to present it to her son, Edward VII. But um, even though they trace, if you like, her lineage back to David, there's no very clear connection um, between um, the story about the daughter of Zedekiah and T Queen Tia Tefe in Irish mythology, other than that they say it's the same person. Do you have any opinions as to why it would have been said in the myth that she was the daughter of a pharaoh? Where, 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 where does, that's, that's not the only instance in Irish mythology of, of the mention of pharaohs. Where, where would that yeah. have come into the thing, do you know? Well, I mean, they they will uh, got that from from the poem uh, that that was written uh, about her and that she was buried in the Murgach, um in Rath Nari. Um, so, but I, it's not really clear why they how they make the connection. They just say it is her, and then they discuss that, you know, and they believe then that if they find the Ark of the Covenant it uh, proves that yeah we need to talk a little bit about um these famous faience beads because in 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 the modern promulgation of this kind of conspiracy theory if we could call it that i see quite a lot of websites that refer to the fact that egyptian faience beads were found uh, around the neck of a young boy that was excavated out of the Mount of the Hostages. Yeah. And it seems that, and it's not just confined to the British Israel, Israelite movement. There are a whole load of people out there who take this as proof that there's a connection between Tia Tefi and Egypt. But in fact, and uh, Derek Ryan, who is the Tipperary antiquarian, who I believe is supposed to be watching tonight. I'm not sure if he's here. If you're here, hello, Derek, um, had written a blog post about that and disseminating the information about that. And in fact, there's absolutely no certainty as to the origin of the faience beads. And there's speculation, in fact, that they're more likely to have originated in Sussex rather than in Egypt, which would appear to blow the whole thing out of the water. But I suppose it's just another example of how you, you sort of latch on to something that appears to offer, mm -hmm. you know, proof. But in fact, when you examine it, it's actually founded on a house of cards. Yeah, well, the thing about the boy king of Tara, who was found in the Mount of the Hostages, was that when they examined his teeth, they realised he was actually from Ireland. And that, as you said, like um, they thought that the beads and that maybe had been imported from Wessex. So 
yeah where yeah. they came originally is another thing so just just in case there's anybody <laughs> watching the finance beads do not prove any link w whatsoever how, how did they um so do you know how did they come to the preposterous conclusion that the Ola Fola was the biblical patriarch prophet Jeremiah and that he had come to Ireland in what was it six 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 seven century BC and that he was in fact buried in the Neolithic passage tomb that we know as Cairn T at Loch Crew. Mm -hmm. Well um, you remember I, I mentioned Reverend Glover and his etymological coincidences so it was based on the name and they thought it meant uh, prophecy and therefore he was the prophet and so what prophet was he? They decided he was uh, Jeremiah and um, they believe that he, he actually came to Tara to root it out and pull it down and destroy it and to establish a transplanted Jerusalem. So, and that he brought the Leah Fall uh, with him because uh, that was a symbol of kingship. And uh, as you know, with the Leah Fall, um, it was associated uh, with Lou and that the voice of Lou would come from the Leah Fall if the rightful king um, was crowned. Um, so there was this idea that the Leah Fall was the symbol of empire or it was Jacob's pillow or mm. that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, and there are the myths then about him being buried in uh, Loch uh, Crew. Well, in order to prove that, I know in modern British Israel literature, perhaps you could comment as to whether this is a thing in the older literature. They say they interpret megalithic art on one of the stones. They say it actually depicts a boat and there, you can see certain stick figures on it. And that's Jeremiah. And this is <laughs> Tefi and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you see, I, I think uh, part of the issue is that if you have a theory, and then you're looking for evidence to fit your theory, including names of people and mythological figures and historical figures, um, then that's what you're going to do. Um, but I mean, it would be impossible to prove one way or the other that um, any of these things um, establish the fact that Olaf Fola was Jeremiah, you know. It just happens to fit the narrative, so they're happy enough with that. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a matter of, if you could ask your just your opinion, where is the real Leofoil? Well, <laughs> well, that's that's a good question because um, there's so many theories about it. Now they had it, the British Israelites had two different theories. They thought uh, the Leofoil was. Uh, under the throne seat in Westminster for the crowning of the kings and queens, and that it had come from Scone, and now it's, it's since gone back to Scone, and they thought there was a second stone on the hill of Tara. And a few years ago, um, uh, there was a man over studying the Leah Fall on the hill of Tara who thought that Jonathan Swift had brought it off to America. So <laughs> that was a new one for me. Uh, so. I think it's very difficult to establish. I presume the Leah Fall is the one, one we see that had been in front of the Mount of the Hostages and was then uh, moved to the furrow to uh, commemorate those that fell in 1798. Yeah, I think the problem here, isn't it, is just one of evidence. How would we ever know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The phallic shaped stone, according to the modern British Israelite literature that you might read on the internet today yeah. suggests that no, that's definitely not the one because it's grotesque and it's phallic and it's, it's pagan, uh, overtly pagan. So that can't be it. But then on the other hand, you think about the fact that it was moved from um, uh, Doan Anil and that yeah. if you look at Nauth, for instance, there are sort of phallic stones situated outside the entrances of Nauth. Mm -hmm. So you may say that this was clearly a thing that happened in prehistory that they set up gnomons or whatever you want to call them phallic stones and there was one on top of Newgrange that disappeared sometime in the 1700s uh, that was recorded there by the first visitors um, so it's not 
entirely unlikely that what we see today was there perhaps all the way back as the Neolithic. But I think didn't they say the British Israelites that the what we what we we call the one that's in in Scone was originally taken by was it Saint Columba to Iona that he was the first one to take it out of Ireland? Yeah, yeah, the, there is a whole story about that and that one of the Scottish kings then brought it to Westminster and that's why they ultimately sent the stone back to Scone. So. How, would you, how would you ever prove you know, <laughs> any of that? You know? Yeah, I, t- you know? I don't know. Um, yeah. The British Israelites, and here's a, here's a convoluted question for you, and I know, thank you for, um, I know that you've seen these questions already, which helps uh, you prepare. The British Israelites and the Freemasons, because a lot of free t- sort of crossover between the British Israelites and the Freemasons at the time of the dig at Tara, but they believed that the Great Pyramid of Cheops was not built by ancient Egyptians because they would have been, quote unquote, too primitive. Instead, they believed it to have been built by British Israelite ancestors in biblical times, conveniently again. This, <laughs> this doesn't it have has shades of the current belief in the modern epoch that, for instance, aliens built the pyramids. And, and, and so we just transplanted that with something else. No, they were being way too primitive to build such sophisticated structures. Therefore, they were built by aliens. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it goes back also to, um, you know, the whole colonial idea that, you um, you know, the natives weren't sophisticated, so they couldn't possibly build any complex structures or like there was uh, discussions about the round towers of Ireland and the idea that they couldn't possibly have been built by the native Irish. Um, But at that time in the 19th century, the British Israelites um, were interested in a lot of kind of esoteric subjects. Uh, like such as pyramidism and the occult and astrology and numerology and and those type of of subjects. And and a lot of the British Israelites involved in the dig were actually uh, Freemasons. And um, Walton Adams and Charles Groom were the men who came initially in 1899 to dig for the um, Ark of the Covenant. And... um, Charles Groom always claimed that he was trying to work out the location of the Ark using uh, Masonic um, methods, <laughs> whatever he meant by that. And uh, Walton Adams was using various measurements of the pyramids in Egypt and the Hill of Tara and measurements of the Ark. And he claimed that there was a relationship between the three of those. Um, but in terms of um, Freemasonry, um, the symbol that Freemasonry and British Israelism have in common is actually the Ark. And you see the Ark of the Covenant on the crest of the Grand Lodge, the Freemasons Hall in, in Dublin. And um, it, it was discussed in, in the Covenant people that um, a Masonic ceremony in memory of the Ark of the covenant, um, could, it could be discontinued whenever they found the ark. Uh, and in, in the museum in, in the Freemasons Hall, there's a, a medallion with the Knights of Tara, uh, 1885, uh, written, inscribed on it. And, and they were believed to be um, a select circle of British Israelites um, who believed the ark of the covenant was buried at uh, Tara. And of course, you have a model of the Ark of the Covenant displayed in, in the National Museum, or not in the National Museum, in the Museum of the Freemasons Hall. And like obviously with Freemasonry as well, um, royalty were involved, like King Edward the Seventh. He, he was a Freemason and a Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of England, uh, you know, so. Um, there was a lot of discussion of about Freemasonry in terms of uh, looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, there was a lot of disagreement about the location, depending on how they worked out where exactly it would be. Yeah, 
And of course, you could be a Catholic and be a Freemason, but you couldn't be a Catholic yes. and be a British Israelite. <laughs> Funnily enough. <laughs> Except that they did discuss, they did discuss in, in, in their journal that uh, that it was possible that Catholics could be British Israelites. They were just led astray by priests. So if they changed their tune, um, maybe they could be British Israelites. Yeah, one has to, of course, in all of this discussion, realise that the position that prevailed in terms of politics, the political situation and the, the difference in the religions and, of course, the bitterness over, you know, the idea that basically the English were coming to uh, vandalise Tara has to sort of play in a, ro a role in your consideration of it. Tell us a little bit about one of the main players in this whole thing, this man called Briscoe. What's that surname? Is that Villiers? Is that is that French Villiers? Villiers? Yeah, sure. Is that <laughs> Gustavus Villiers Briscoe? Yeah, he seemed to be quite an interesting character. Um, he was the landlord at Tara, and he gave the British Israelites uh, permission to dig there. And the OPW initially sent somebody up to the hill of Tara, and demanded that they stop the excavations. But it turned out the OPW weren't within their legal rights to do that. And they ended up um, having to pay Briscoe um, compensation. And uh, he continued on directing the operations up there, even though obviously he wasn't an archeologist. And uh, the OPW thought that he was being paid by the British Israelites from uh, their Tara Exploration Fund. So. Well, that's a suspicion that you couldn't be proved, but I suppose it's a natural, uh, it's a natural position to take. Uh, yeah. but now we do know that there was one very important woman in this whole sort of scenario. That when the digging got underway and it seemed to cause a lot of upset. By the way, I know from my own research that I, I've, I've read reports in, for instance, the local newspaper here in Drogheda, the Drogheda Independent, uh, covered the matter. Um, and was scathing in its criticism of what was happening at Tara. But then I read, I'm not sure which Belfast newspaper it was, about a lecture that had been given by one of the British Israelites. And although you could tell from the article that they were standing back and saying, we're not quite sure that this guy is kind of telling the truth, but they didn't castigate. And so it depended on what side you were on. But the woman who was sort of most influential in, in drumming up opposition to it was, of course, Maud Gone. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how she got the whole thing uh, sort of portrayed as, 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 as an act of vandalism. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, she went up to the Hill of Tara with uh, Arthur Griffith, the editor of the United Irishman uh, at the time, um, on Christmas Day 1900. And then after seeing the destruction of, of Tara, she wrote uh, an article which was published on the 5th of January, 1901. And that sparked uh, the media campaign to get the diggings uh, stopped. And on foot of that, then you had um, parliamentary questions and so forth asked in Westminster. But she, she also traveled up there with um, 300 children um, and Inini Naharan and um, organized a patriotic children's treat um, in 1902. And the landlord Briscoe had organized a, a bonfire to, you know, light in honor of the forthcoming coronation of Edward VII, Queen Victoria's son. Yeah. But she got to the matches first and she lit the fire and sang A Nation Once Again. And she was delighted with that. And afterwards she wrote to WB Yeats saying the RIC were dancing with rage and that this added greatly to the fun. So she really enjoyed herself up there. A brilliant seemed. moment of propaganda. Um, yeah. What, what was Yeats's role in this? Y Yeats sometimes is portrayed, isn't he? Arthur Griffith didn't like Yeats, isn't that right? No, no, he, Arthur Griffith did not like uh, Yeats. He, he, he didn't like Yeats, but he also didn't like the Society of Antiquaries or the Royal, Royal Irish uh, Academy because he felt that they were hanging around with the British Israelites. And they were, it, it, the whole thing, were they? Yeah, that they were from the same class, if you like. So um, they weren't within their legal rights to stop 
the exploration. So then they decided that they would meet the relevant people and try and persuade them. But as far as Arthur Griffith was concerned, he said they were just selling Tara for dinner and champagne and they were hanging around all these gentlemen clubs in Dublin. And he, I think he called the Royal Irish Academy old daughters whose veins were full of dirty water, he said. That's how he described them. And he said that the OPW were full of foreigners. And he was also very anti-Semitic as well. So uh, he said a lot of scurrilous things hmm. about a lot of people, I think. So it could be said there was a bit of racism and discrimination on both sides, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me about this little incident about was it Griffith who went to Tara and and uh, uh, Gustav Gustavus was up against the wall <laughs> and he had a rifle and and he was he was swigging back some whiskey. Yeah, like actually Arthur Griffith went up there with uh, George Moore, the novelist, and uh, W. B. Yeats and Douglas Hyde. Hyde yeah. All four of them uh, went up and uh, Gustavus was directing operations and drinking his whiskey and he had a man with a rifle beside him and he told them they couldn't walk on to the hill of Tara but um, uh, Arthur Griffith decided that they were entitled to walk on the city of their kings and he walked on the onto the hill of Tara anyway and but the man with the rifle stood back and allowed them to go ahead but a few days later, then they uh, wrote a letter to the Times of London um, giving out about the um, destruction of Tara and the fact that there was no archaeological supervision. And they said um, that it was probably the most consecrated uh, spot in, in Ireland and that there'd be a lot of bitter memories after the destruction. Yeah. And that was signed by Yeats and Hyde uh, and Moore. So they were sort of, I suppose, uh, they had a sort of fundamental or an important role in the propaganda against the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Given the t that a lot of the tensions around the thing were to do with religion, were to do with uh, racism and imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think it would have been easier to secure permission had the archaeologists actually been Irish or would it have made any difference? Um, just judging by the kind of scurrilous things Arthur Griffith was saying about them all and, and all of that and the legal situation, um, I don't think it would made, have made any difference because, say, for example, uh, Robert Cochran, who was um, in the OPW, he was trying to put a stop to the diggings, but at the same time he was sending subscriptions to the British Israelite journal the covenant people and he was a freemason so a lot of them had a foot in both camps if you like so while he was genuine about trying to stop the destruction of tara and wanted um proper archaeological supervision on the other hand they actually wanted to see was the ark of the covenant up there and they subscribed to british israelite beliefs sometimes you know a severe so, case of sitting on the fence, one might be, one yeah. might be, or as you say, having uh, one foot in each camp. Uh, just, uh, Marie, help us with a little bit of confusion here, or certainly help me with some confusion. So there's this whole discussion about the Murgach, which is apparently the place that they identified as the, the resting place of, of Tia, or Tia, yeah. supposed to have been located between what we call today on Fura, the, the royal seat, and Chalk Cormac, that figure of yeah. eight monument. Yes. Uh, so why didn't they dig there? I mean, what led them to actually dig at uh, Rama Shanad? And, and where did the king's chair get its name from? Okay, well, you see, initially, the person who applied to dig up on the hill of Tara was a man called Reverend Hannam, and he was rector of Two Prairie, and he was um, a, a British Israelite. And initially, he applied to try and find the book of Jeremiah, but the collector ran away with the money and it didn't happen. And then he made three separate applications to dig on the hill and they were all refused. Um, and he believed that the Ark of the Covenant um, was buried in the America, <coughs> excuse me, um, which was in Ratnari. But he wasn't the one who came to actually do the illegal diggings. That was Charles Groom and Waltham Adams. And they, there was a lot of discussion about Freemasonry in respect of those men. And they decided that it was actually buried in the wrath of 
the synods. Now, we don't know if it was because maybe that there had been two golden torques found in the wrath of the synods that were dating to the Middle Bronze Age, which is around 1200 to 1000 BC, and also that um, the, the wrath of the synods uh, got its name uh, from saints, St. Patrick and St. Rouen and St. Adovnon holding their synods there. Um, so uh, they targeted the, the king's chair, which is a, a mound in, in the wrath of the synods. Now, um, it's not known really if it was just th th that combination um, of things that made them targeted because um, Hannon had believed uh, that the Mergek was in Rathnery because of uh, George Petrie's map uh, showed it. Um, so it's, it's, it's not clear why they decided that they wouldn't dig there. If they had been given enough time and if the campaign hadn't, I mean, gone and Griffith et, et, et al., if they hadn't organised that sort of very vocal, vociferous campaign of opposition, yeah, is it true, in your opinion, that they would have wrecked the whole bloody hill? Oh, oh I think, like, if they had been allowed to continue, like, if they didn't find it in Wrath of the Synods, they'd be going back to Wrath Marie. Mm. You know, if if, if uh, because the landlord had allowed them to dig, and he was within his legal rights because the monument was infested in the Office of Public Works, and that meant he was free to dig if he wanted to dig. They did, um, yeah. you know, they didn't just actually uh, pay him compensation. They had to apologise to him, didn't they? Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, we talked about Arthur Griffiths being threatened with being shot. Um, tell us about what is your overall assessment of what took place at Tara? Mm. Well, if you think about the whole episode, it, it took place against the backdrop of the cultural uh, revival. And so you had tensions really about the cultural ownership of the archaeological site of Tara. And archaeological sites in the 19th century were becoming really important. Um, and if you like, uh, the British Israelites were interpreting it as a transplanted Jerusalem in a new Israel. And the Irish nationalists were interpreting it as the ancient capital of an independent Ireland, a time they were independent. And that was a time they wanted to go back to. So that was going to be important to the future, as well as the past, if you like. And both sides were drawn from history and mythology and archaeology to kind of arrive at different political conclusions. Yeah, well, well, with the benefit of hindsight, we now know that almost everything the British Israelites said was a load of nonsense. But, but talk just for a second of, about the other side of the argument. Hmm. You know, that belief that Tara is somehow... Like, that's the belief we would have today about Tara, that it is a, an ancient centre of, you know, the golden age of Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Was that something that was also concocted or would that have already been a genuine belief in, in, among the indigenous people of Ireland? Well, I, I mean, the thing is, um, even though they wrote a great deal about Tara, say, in the medieval period, um, it, it became kind of the focus of, assemblies and like you had the Battle of Tara in 1798 and uh, like e even in recent times the 1916 commemoration um, you know the declaration was read on the hill of Tara because Tara is just a, has that long association with the high kings uh, and so forth so it would have all there would have always been a certain reverence for the site but then say in the in the period of the cultural revival it became even more important politically yeah it, it must have been galling though to some of the locals this idea that was being promulgated that somehow in some confused logic and twisted interpretation of myth and biblical tracts that Tara had suddenly become some sort of New Jerusalem and that this was a key uh, anchoring point in the British Empire. 
Mm. Notwithstanding the fact that we had medieval manuscripts that talked about, you know, 150 kings reigning there from the time of Erebon, yeah. which, according to some sources, he, he goes back to the Bronze Age. It must have been sort of really galling to them, wasn't mm. it? But I, I suppose at the time they were digging, like um, Tara uh, would have been seen as a royal site in the British Empire simply because Ireland wasn't independent at that time. Um, but at the same time, the tradition was very, very strong in terms of, of it being the ancient capital and all the stories about the banqueting hall and the feasting of the kings and so forth. Yeah, I presume it was quite galling for people. Yes, but there is a, indeed, of course, on that side of the fence, there is a lot of romanticizing uh, and you know, this idea of a golden age. Anybody who's studied medieval Ireland knows that it was a bloody epoch and mm. kings were, were killing rival kings and stabbing their eyes out and killing their kids and all sorts of stuff. Uh, mm. So we know we know from our studies now that a lot of that, of course, was mythologizing. One sort of large question that I will finish with, uh, and then uh, I have a couple of viewer questions. Is there any credibility at all to anything that the British Israelites said or wrote about Tara? Um, well, you see, they were writing about it in a biblical framework. And I, I think um, a lot of the theories linking the Bible with Tara are quite dubious. It seems that way anyway, uh, as to whether they uh, Ark of the Covenant exists or not? I, I don't know, but I, I'm certain it's not in Tara. How did you know I was going to ask that? Because I, <laughs> I just scribbled that down a while ago. Do you believe that the Ark of the Covenant exists? <laughs> um, I, like, I simply don't know, but um, um, un unless Connor Newman got his geophysical survey all wrong, he definitely didn't come up with the Ark of the, Car the Covenant, unless he found it and it's in his garage, maybe, or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, for, for what it's worth, uh, my own personal belief is that this is typical of a situation where uh, scripture, which is, uh, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I, I would view a lot of scripture as being mythology, mythologized. Um, I, I don't think the Ark of the Covenant actually exists as a real tangible mm. item. Uh, mm. It is the, the difficulty with a lot of interpretation of mythologies that people refuse to look at the metaphors. And as I always say, in relation to the Bible, and especially in relation to the New Testament, uh, you know, the, the, the hero, as it were, of the whole modern Christian movement is Jesus. And Jesus spoke to his friends in parables. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so should we not also be look, perhaps taking some of these passages a little bit less lit uh, uh, literally? I suppose it appeals to the imagination greatly because of the way it's described, you know, and it's a golden chest and cherubims on the top and all of that. Well, I think it could be fairly said that if hypothetically such a thing was to be found, it, it 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 would be a great proof, and uh, you know you could imagine there'd be great sort of celebration and triumph among certain swathes of people of certain beliefs. But they've been looking for it in a lot of places. Yeah, and uh, we know from various TV series and books that the Ark is said to have gone in so many different directions and to be in so mm -hmm. many different resting places. I think yeah. that you and I both agree that the likelihood that it will be found buried under the green grass of Tara is highly unlikely. Very <laughs> slim. Uh, Sue, Sue Prenter on Facebook sent me a question, which was, since the publication of your book, Tara and the Ark of the Covenant, has there been any response from the British Archaeological Society or indeed the British Israelite movement? Not that I know of, even though at, at my book launch, I remember that one of the senior uh, Freemasons from the Free, Freemasons Hall turned up and uh, he was quite interested. Um, but we've never heard from British Israelites. The other thing about British Israelites is that they generally don't I, identify themselves uh, clearly as British Israelites. They always, like even Reverend Hannon, when he made his applications, he made it as an antiquarian. You know, 
he did not identify himself as a British Israelite. And often that's the case. They don't necessarily identify themselves publicly as British Israelites. Was, was he the one who established like an Irish office? It was at Molesworth Street in Dublin. Was he the one who sort of tried to establish headquarters for them in Ireland? Um, yeah, he was president of the British Israel Association of Ireland. Um, you know, so that that was set up uh, the year he made the third application and the third application was turned down. Very interesting. Marie, uh, it's been a great pleasure. I mean, uh, this is a subject that I think could provoke hours and hours of conversation. I, th I suppose the main thing from my point of view is that I have been, uh, because of my work in the media, I, I have encountered characters from that movement in modern times who still insist that the Ark is buried at Tara and who indeed tried to persuade uh, p p certain political individuals uh, to allow them to dig. Um, but if a modern archaeologist was to go back in time and arrive magically in, at 1899 on the Hill of Tara, I mean, isn't it true that they would be absolutely horrified by what they saw? Yeah, yeah, they, they really would because um, there was major destruction on the wrath of the synods and you can see it clearly, the damage uh, that was uh, done. But uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, it's a good thing that there was the media campaign to stop it because they would have really destroyed the site, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So all that remains for me to do, if you don't mind waiting around for two or three minutes, Maraid, I might yeah. just be, if, is there anybody in the audience that would like to ask Maraid a question? If you just maybe just wave your hand that we can uh, keep an eye out for if there are any questions. Um, you don't have to ask a question, but just in case anyone does want to ask a question, um, please do. I don't see any hands, do I? Um, okay, well, while, uh, if just in case anyone's thinking of a question, Maureen, I forgot totally Eva Anderson. Okay, we'll get to Eva in a second. I have to apologize to you that in fact, I mentioned two books, your other book, The Quest for the Irish Celt, which we haven't had an opportunity yeah. to talk about tonight, but of course, uh, you also uh, have oh, the, yeah. the Tara yeah. Guidebook, which yeah. I actually would highly recommend to anybody who's not familiar with the archaeology and the mythology and the traditions of Tara. I would highly recommend actually this is a very good starting point. And of course, if you're interested in tonight's topic, you can't be without what is the definitive uh, book and really the only book. Uh, worth reading uh, that I know of about uh, Tara and the whole thing about the Ark and the British Israelites and uh, that shameful episode in history. Mm. So I, I just should give a plug for your books. Can people buy your books directly from you, signed copies? Is that something you do? Um, uh, they have to get them, I, I think, from the Discovery Program generally okay. is where you get them. With the Tara and the Ark of the Covenant, you can get it from the Royal Irish Academy on their website. Yeah, yeah, Royal Irish Academy, brilliant. So Eva Anderson, if you would maybe unmute and ask Maraid your question. Yes. I am unmuted, hopefully. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, first of all, what I've been doing right now is uh, telling my university library to buy the book because that's how I do it <laughs> because, you know, not spending yeah. my own money, but spending the library's money. I was writing in the comment session that I'm, I find is extremely fascinating, this connection with the Freemasons. And I also have colleagues, I'm a historian, but we have his, people who are uh, historians of religion who study the culture, mm -hmm. the occult traditions of the late 19th century. And I was wondering, do you know of any research or maybe you have self have written about this of the connection, the greater connection with like the order of the golden dawn and things like that? Mm -hmm. Well, not so much that there's a connection, but people at that time were very, very interested. Mm -hmm. Like uh, obviously WB Yeats and the Order of the Golden Dawn and people were interested in spiritualism and the occult and pyramidism. And they were very busy try trying to connect them all. And certainly up on the Hill of Tara, there was a, a lot of discussion about say, the pyramids of Egypt and the the various measurements and the Hill of Tara and the and also the Ark of the Covenant. And, but a, a lot of the connections are a bit tenuous, really. Yeah, you more know. like people being in contact, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And you got the same people in all these organizations. Um, and that became 
a little bit of a difficulty when they wanted to stop the explorations because they were in the same Freemason lodges maybe together. Uh, or, you know, and also if you think of archaeology at the time, like antiquarianism mm -hmm. was considered quite an esoteric subject. Um, it's only later on that it became more and more scientific. Like it, it, you had the beginnings of scientific archaeology at mm -hmm. that stage so that they were very aware that the British Israelites, if they were just treasure hunting, if you like, they could potentially destroy the site. Mm -hmm. But it, strangely enough, the British Israelites weren't what you'd call treasure hunters because they thought that it was like creating a new world order for them. It, it, it was a, a bigger idea to them. It wasn't simply the gold of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and also because they were, even if they were weird, they were sort of buying into the main ide ideology of the time, which is Christianity. Yeah. So, so they're yeah. not really treasure hunt. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I'm definitely yeah. going to get them to buy <laughs> to buy your books. So I don't have to do it. I mean, and also yeah. the good thing with actually ordering the university library to do it is that other people can read it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah, I usually do true. these things for yeah. my students. Yeah. Thank you very much for your, your yeah. question, Eva. Thank you. Uh, Thank you indeed. And we have one more question, Marie, and that is from Peter Woods. Peter, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Hi, Marie, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for the conversation. Yourself and Anthony is absolutely captivating. Um, I'll come at one question and then maybe another. Um, did this English Archaeological Society actually ever find anything? That um, could be like um, validated, as opposed to just like <laughs> their own kind of journey. Well, you see, it, wa it wasn't an English archaeological society who was digging terra. It was the British Israel Association of London. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah. So they they um, they were specifically interested in the Ark of the Covenant, and they believed it to be buried at Tara and they funded those people to go and dig Tara. Um, but they wouldn't have dug a lot of other sites or anything to find the Ark of the Covenant. It was just specifically a Tara exploration fund um, targeting that particular site. Okay, so is, is it just kind of convenient that it was Tara or was it like, um... You could kind of look at it from a kind of conspiracy point of view. Were they looking at like the the central part of Irish history to dig apart? Um, no, it was uh, directed at Tara because at the time, you see, they would have considered Tara to be a royal site in the British Empire because uh, Ireland wasn't independent at the time. Um, it, it wasn't that they were specifically deciding to if you like attack Irish history or anything like that. Um, it's just that they thought of it as part of the history of the British Empire, whereas Irish um, nationalists would think of it as being separate from the British were Empire. Were we necessarily behaving properly at the time when they decided to dig? Um, well, you see, the uh, landlord gave them permission. So yeah. they, they, were within their, they weren't doing anything I illegal but they were destroying the site, um, you know, because uh, the um, Tara wasn't vested in the Office of Public Works, you know, and that was up to the landlord to decide whether that could happen or not, you know. I had no idea that the Office of Public Works existed at such an early stage. It's called the Board of Works back then. Or Board of Works, well, exactly. It was, well, yeah, yeah. Peter, that's right. thanks a million for your yeah. Thank you. As always, lovely to yeah. hear from you. Peter just lives out the road here in, right. in Monaster Boys outside Rada. Um, I just have one thing to say before we close, and that is that next week's guest, who I believe is actually in the house tonight, is Patrick McCafferty. And the subject will be comets in Irish right. mythology. And right. that is going to be yeah. one that I am yeah. uh, almost uh, equally interested uh, in, in as this week's topic. Mairead, can I say on behalf of myself and on behalf of everyone who is here tonight, thank you for your time. 
it's been riveting from beginning to end. And I'm delighted that um, you're so, the knowledge uh, is obviously so fresh with you. I mean, your book was published, what was it? Was it 17 or 18 years ago? 18 years ago, yeah. So, and it's obviously yeah. still fresh in yeah. your mind. And it's just yeah. wonderful to have your perspective on it. So thank you indeed for- and Thank you. Agreeing to take part. And so folks, if you just want to unmute and say thanks and good night, uh, that'll be it. And we'll see you next week for uh, episode thanks, eight. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. 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 For a, a regular episode in the meantime of Live Irish Myths. That'll be 140, by the way. So uh, we'll see you then. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Good